So what I thought I'd kind of cover this morning is I'm going to cover a little bit about my background, how I got started in game development, how that evolved over the years, uh, and where I got to today with some of the things he talked about, like uh, the bridge simulator, which I'm going to talk about more towards the end, uh, and where that led me with other gaming projects. But one of the things uh, I want to kind of communicate as we're going through this this morning is not just to talk about myself, it's really to talk about uh, what I call your toolbox. And I don't mean, you know, uh, code, uh, code libraries like Angular or something like that. I mean building your toolbox as you go along as a game developer. Uh, that's something that I took with me over the years is as you code and you continue to learn and you continue to grow as a developer, uh, you take things with you from project to project. Uh, and as a game developer, it becomes your toolbox. You're like, oh, well, I need this asset. Well, I can pull this over here and I can pull that over there. Now, of course, in the modern days of the internet, uh, it's a lot easier than it was, say, 20 years ago. <laughs> but uh, let's get started. So again, as Jeremy said, uh, I'm Dave Hernley. I'm the founder and CEO of Mythric Studios. Uh, we're based locally just across the water in Newport News, Virginia. And uh, we've been doing uh, various types of game development since uh, 2000. Uh, I'm going to cover a lot of those different things as we go through it. But uh, where did it all start? So uh, I'm 47 years old, by the way. I've lived most of my life in Virginia. And uh, this is where it started for me. Does anybody know what that is? Silence. That is a TRS-80 Model 3 with one color. <laughs> um, you had to write in basic or assembler. Uh, I started on that in 1978. So uh, you can imagine the graphics programming and that was, was not very extensive. But uh, I wrote uh, various text adventures on that and that's where my, my journey started. From there, um, over the years, working with uh, TRS-80, Apple II, uh, doing game development for that. I'm going to fast forward though, and actually I missed a slide, so I apologize for the. But uh, there's a part of there in the 80s working on the Amiga. Anybody ever played with or know about the Amiga? A few hands. Okay, that's good. That's something. Um, so this is Conquest of the Known World. Um, this is a browser-based game that was around for about five years in the early 2000s. This is where we got started. Uh, it was a technically a massive multiplayer, but you did it exclusively through your browser and you would build your forces up and you would uh, conquest across different lands and it was built so you could have different worlds. You could have a pirate setting in the Caribbean, you could have chivalry which is based in you know, England, you could have something in ancient Rome. And what we set out to do in talking about building the toolbox was uh, we had a lot of things out there you know, with uh, Microsoft and the different tools but we actually took the time to build our own web server uh, for this. And what that really means is uh, I, took a, I created a 38K web server that did everything it needed to do relative to sessions and everything else. Instead of having uh, you know, Microsoft IIS or Apache or any of those that are out there, uh, this is going to come back in the discussion as we keep talking through it. Uh, and I'm assuming, by the way, none of you have probably played that <laughs> from almost 20 years ago now. Okay. Um, around the same time, I built something that was never released called iHome. Now, there's a whole series of consumer products nowadays uh, that are branded as iHome. In the 90s, I wrote this, never copyrighted it, so lesson, by the way, if you come up with a great idea or a name, don't sit on it. <laughs> uh, but this is what iHome was before it was hardware. Um, this was essentially interactive home. It used a technology that is essentially uh, a dead technology now called X10. Uh, for home automation. Nowadays, you'd hear it uh, as Z-Wave or Zigbee, um, you know, for Philips Hue lights and things like that that you might see in Best Buy. Um, this was built to actually control a home through voice. So imagine 20 years before Alexa walking into your house and saying, you know, turn on the living room lights, but doing it with a persona. Okay, another trivia question, and I'm really dating myself constantly through this uh, presentation, but does anybody know what that red character is? on screen. All right, what is it? Come on. The villain from Trump. What's the villain's name? You're right, but that's it. The master control program. So the concept here was that you could actually code a persona and have different personas in every room. So in the master bedroom, it could be the master control program. In the kid's bedroom, it could be Winnie the Pooh. Uh, you know, in the, the living room, it could be just, you know, Hal from uh, you know, uh, 2001, etc. 
and you could control your, your house. And why I'm spending time on this before we get to games is really what I talked about when I first brought this slide up. If you have an idea, don't sit on it. Let it evolve, let it create, whether it's the name or just the concept. This was never released, and this is 20 years ago, where you could control your home through your voice, control devices, do everything through that with automation. All the stuff you're hearing about now, okay, so one of my kind of lessons learned and mistakes, if you will, was never doing anything this other than it being just a neat little side project for me. Um, so how many of you actually, I, I'm just gonna ask a generic question, ha, have had an idea but you, you've let it percolate, right? You haven't really done much with it but you have this cool idea and you're just waiting for the right time. Seriously, uh, yeah. Um, now I, I'm gonna ask a simple question that I don't expect you to answer to me here but I, you know, I want you to talk to me about it afterwards or just think about it to yourself. Uh, why are you waiting? Right? Now, there might be a legitimate reason, but for me, since I started working on that first computer in 1977 and 78, in those two years, uh, I never stopped just trying stuff, right? Let me try this, let me try that. And I'll tell you the one thing for me that has gotten me into trouble, uh, and I say that tongue in cheek in terms of developing games and developing content and software, is that very thing, but I love it. Meaning, uh, when I uh, went to do Starship Horizons, which we're gonna talk about in a bit, there was already this game called Artemis. Anybody heard of Artemis? I'm sure this, yeah, that, that came out before Horizons, so that was first. Uh, and when I decided to do Horizons, uh, a friend of mine locally, uh, Ethan O'Toole, looked at me and said, you're nuts. Why would you spend time doing that? That's a massive project, that you're wasting your time. Well, it's fun to be, uh, to be uh, ignorant sometimes, isn't it? Um, don't be afraid of this mountain because for me, it's really not a mountain, is it? I mean, you're not coding the whole thing at once. You're not coding it in one session. You're coding bits and pieces, right? Um, especially as an indie developer, you, know, you are your own agile shop. <laughs> you're constantly evolving what you're working on, and you can only work on one thing at a time, right? So don't look at it as a mountain. Look at it as a path up the mountain uh, and work on your project. And so that's why I said if you have this cool idea that you haven't acted on, because you maybe think, oh, there's just too many things I have to worry about, and I, there's too many obstacles, and oh, I have to deal with this, and I have to create assets, and I have to do all this artwork, and I have to do all these uh, programming routines to get out to the web and do all these other things. Don't look at it like that. Look at it in pieces. Um, one of the simplest things I tell people, um, and I've had people at Pixel Fest come to me when we're gonna be running, her and by the way, Horizons will be running uh, tomorrow all day, so come by and play it. We'll, uh, we'll talk more about that. But the question I get is, well, how do I get started, right? And all of you, I'm sure, have you know, already started in some capacity, right? You've already done a little bit of coding. Some of you may have already released a little game here or there in a game jam, right? But they keep asking, like, how do I get started? I just don't understand how to do it. And my simple thing is, talking about the toolbox, is start with something simple. Just write a tic-tac-toe program that you can play against. Sounds silly, but do something and complete it, right? Complete a small project that works and then you build on that. Okay, I'm gonna go from tic-tac-toe to chess maybe, or I'm gonna go, and you just continue to step up. And what I talked about with your toolbox where you've learned how to, okay, I learned how to deal with this routine and how that needs to work. So now when I go over here, I can take that and apply it in a more complex manner. So, and I sidebar it a little bit, but I always feel that's kind of important to talk about. So this was from 1997. So this is actually a little bit before iHome, but I'm bringing this up. This is where Starship Horizons came from. Um, this is where it started. This is actually was written in Visual Basic 6. Yeah, um, I, ouch is what I would tell you, ouch. Uh, there is a, uh, a game that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit uh, that this came from, but the idea was I wanted to create a simulation system where you could play together with your friends. Um, obviously, I didn't own the rights to Star Trek, so this was me playing around. This was me, again, just playing around with some code, see what I could do with 3D rendering and 3D space. Uh, and I, I was actually really proud of myself to actually get 3D rendering to happen in Visual Basic 6. That's like trying to write 3D programming in Access, folks. It's, it's, not, it's not pretty. Um, but you'll see where we have the map and everything else. But that's where it started. Now, I did this for about a year, and the technology really wasn't there. The web was around, but it was, it was not what we think of today as the web. 
you know, JavaScript was not as evolved as it is. There's no such concept as uh, web sockets and other things like that. So this project got put on the shelf, uh, and because it, technology really wasn't there. But we're going to keep going. Okay. So that was the genesis of Starship Horizons. Let's talk about why. Oh, forgot I had that slide in there. <laughs> That's why. I, I'm old enough where this is my version of Khan. <laughs> uh, the Wrath of Khan, Star Trek II, you know, Starship Battles in Space. Uh, what they did for that movie was it was really more about naval battles in space, like Horatio Hornblower in space. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. And the idea of you and your friends getting together on an actual working bridge was something that always was burned into my brain all the way back to 1982. I wanted that experience. That's why I was trying that silly little Visual Basic 6 app. But this is what it got to. Now, I'm, I know some of you, I, I've recognized some of you from previous Pixel Fests, but how many of you have actually played Starship Horizon so far? A couple of hands? Okay. So this is for up to six players. And you actually sit in front of a touchscreen console, and each of you have your role on the ship. A captain, a flight officer, a tactical officer, an engineer, a communications, and sciences. And all of you have to work on your individual stations in order for the mission to succeed. And you have structured missions that you go through and explore. Some are as quick as 10 minutes, others are as long as an hour, depending on what kind of mission you play, and well, frankly, how, considering how you play. Um, the most common mistake players make, this is not a joke, is running into planets. Those giant, many, many, many kilometer long size, big spheres in space they somehow can't avoid. This uh, is the setup we did for a, an event called Too Many Games. That is three projection screens, that's 20 feet wide for a panoramic main view screen and 20 touch screen displays. In, uh, uh, basically a surrounding six players. So it was kind of like the traveling Star Trek experience. And obviously, as I showed you on the slide, Star Trek is very much the inspiration for what Starship Horizons is. Um, the important thing about this is, what you're gonna see tomorrow is kind of a, we're not, that's not gonna be there tomorrow, <laughs> but we're gonna have the smaller convention version. It's the same software scaling up with the hardware. So whatever hardware you throw at it to add displays, you can do that. One of the things technically, and I haven't talked technical much, but I'm gonna start doing that here as we kind of talk about Horizons. Horizons came out of the need to do the simulation, so some of the challenges we had to do technically and, and deal with from programming is hardware. And what I mean by hardware is you'll see the blue hue underneath that there. That's actually uh, something called DMX lighting, DMX lighting control, which is usually used for stage performances in theater. So Horizons can natively can control DMX lights, Philips Hue, Z-Wave, Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and it can interact with all of those to create an immersive experience for players. So I have, uh, we have actually in Newport News a gentleman who took his uh, space over his garage and built a permanent bridge, a Hollywood style starship bridge with this and has the lighting and everything built in, but also fog. So when the ship takes damage, the fog will spill into the room. Now we're not gonna be doing anything with fog tomorrow, <laughs> just to be clear. Um, can't quite do that in convention spaces, you know, safety reasons and everything. But delivery-wise, what you're seeing here is two things. That main view screen is hardware rendered on the video card on the physical machine running Horizons. Everything else you see is HTML5 running with WebSockets. Now, I talked about the toolbox. I'm going to kind of circle back to that a little bit. Uh, I mentioned when I wrote that game Chivalry, I wrote that little kernel to do our own web server, right? That came forward and was updated with you know, modern coding conventions for Horizons, pulling from my toolbox. Horizons also supports voice control, taking what I learned from iHome and voice control, pulling that forward into the project. Hardware, dealing with lights, iHome, pulling that forward, again, toolbox taking everything you've learned and being able to pull it forward. So for me, I like to take time and talk about the games that inspired me, not just you know what inspired me, we talked about Star Trek, but the games that inspired me and inspired Horizons from a design standpoint. I very much like to look at, you know, these are games that I played and enjoyed, 
Uh, I always take time to point these out for a few minutes because I always like to give people ideas to say, okay, if you like space games and you want to create a space game, here's some things that if you've never played, take the time. Uh, because I think one of the mistakes I see is, you know, retro gaming is much bigger now than it used to be, but there was a long connotation of, oh, it's an old game, obviously it's obsolete. There are so many games out there from 20, 30 years ago that have so many neat ideas that have never either been revisited or revisited correctly. You know, uh, you'll see the game dev shops that own an IP try to recreate their success with a previous game, but they didn't get or understand what really made that first game a success with the fun factor or the aspect that was really creative. Um, one of those games in particular I'm gonna talk about. So Imtrek, Telnet, who knows what Telnet is? Yeah, I love how few hands come up and most of the stuff I'm referencing tells you how old I am. But uh, this was in the 80s where you could actually, on a dial-up modem, connect in and play mul massive multiplayer. It was up to 128 players in a 3D universe rendered in a, in a little command window. On your left-hand side was your ship, the middle was essentially your radar, and the right-hand side was anything you were scanning. Of course, the bottom was for messages but it was a full realized 3D space, and you can still play it today uh, in your browser with JavaScript. Um, I would tell you, grab a friend and try it. It may not be your cup of tea, but it's, it's worth your time to at least look at, because what's amazing is this does 3D space combat better than any 3D game I've actually played. Um, meaning it's full three degrees of freedom. Your entire universe is not just on a flat plane. Everything is connected up and down in X, Y, and Z, and very well thought out, even though there's not a single graphic in the entire game. X-Wing, a property that desperately needs to come back, frankly, and hasn't, has been gone for quite some time. But uh, it, basically, a starship simulator, a fighter, uh, almost, you know, a fighter combat simulator, but done with Star Wars universe. But brilliantly done, deep mission design. This is something that we really focused on when we w worked on Horizons is, it wasn't just, okay, go shoot a bunch of TIE fighters and come back. You know, you actually had deep concepts with mission design where you had to deal with, okay, I'm dealing with a convoy, they have to be safe, but I have to get over here and do this, and we have to handle that. So you were dealing with multiple factors, and the storylines were always very well written. And of course, what was the secret sauce for that game was the responsiveness of the actual simulation. The fighter aspect was just so much fun to play, and they layered great content on top of it. Uh, again, similar timeline, early 90s, Wing Commander. Much more action-oriented than Star Wars was, uh, but the campaigns were well-scripted, and again, three degrees of freedom like X-Wing. And at the time, these were revolutionary for that. But again, its secret weapon was the actual controls and the fun factor of the experience. Okay, Starflight 1 and 2. These are uh, 80s and early 90s, uh, essentially an RPG of the, the early days. Now, they did a great thing of mixing RPG with action. Basically, most of the game was an RPG style that you might think of a, in an old school style RPG, but when you got into space combat, you actually flew the ships around almost like a little arcade sequence. Uh, so it mixed that up pretty well. Uh, this had a really creative NPC conversation system. I've seen a few MMOs use something similar, but you'll see on the right hand side there where you can make a statement, ask a question, you can posture or leave. So it was not just Here's a series of things you can ask and that you're and you're done. You actually could sh shape how you're conversing with the individual NPCs. And it mattered because sometimes you would have to posture in order to kind of get them to finally open up and tell you a piece of information. You couldn't just go and say, okay, ask them question two, question three, question one, and step through. Star Control. I uh, spent a lot of time on this one. Uh, they actually have released an, a fully licensed open source version, well, they say licensed, but fully available li open source version you can play uh, today that has the full 3DO version with voice and uh, full audio tracks and everything, so they've really evolved it well. But really about a massive universe with thousands of planets, and you had to explore the whole thing. I've actually, uh, I had enough time in my college days where I explored every one of those dots and each one of those is not a planet, that's a star system. And each underneath that, there's you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten planets, depending on the size. And every one they had actually crafted, the developers crafted, this is not a dynamically generated universe. They actually went through and painstakingly created an entire map. And now, I talked about it before, Star Control 2, 
brilliant game. Star Control 1 was fun. Star Control 2 was a really great evolution. Star Control 3 came out uh, a good number of years, late 90s, so it was a good uh, period between 2 and 3. Terrible game because they focused on, oh, well, let's make the universe even more diverse. Let's focus on planet rendering and all this other stuff. And they ditched the elegance of the exploration and the combat. Uh, again, not focusing on what actually made the game fun. They went in the wrong direction, so it tanked. And you, you've not heard of Star Control until just recently. They actually just, uh, the IP was bought by a company and they're just now bringing out a new version of it. Okay, so let's see. Do I wanna talk about that? Yeah, sure. Starship Horizons. <laughs> then this happened. This was last year. Uh, Starship Horizons, by, by the way, has been around for about five years. Um, we've been at a lot of conventions. We've been at every Pixel Vest since the first one. Woo! Um, and we'll be there tomorrow. Uh, Starship Escape, uh, who, who's played an escape room? Okay, locally, anybody played Escape to Win over off of, uh, oh, okay, all right, go ahead. Um, so, a company uh, that does escape rooms out of Boston, out of Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, wanted to do a Starship Escape, and so they called me up and said, hey, we want to do this thing where they're trying to escape a Starship, and you've got this simulation, can we work with you to create this really immersive experience where they have to you know, get out of the cargo bay and then get in and break into the bridge and then take control of the bridge. And I said, well, that sounds cool. So we worked with them and got them all live. And a week after they went live, um, I got a call from the owner and he said, um, Dave, I need to talk to you about something. And I said, uh, okay, what's wrong? What's broken? He said, no, 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 nothing's broken, but how can I use Horizons in my other rooms? Like, can you just get rid of the 3D stuff so I can use the engine in the other rooms. And by engine, I'm talking about the hardware control, the voice control, dealing with the lights, all of the event system that was written for it. And I, I didn't really know what he meant at the time. I, I was kind of confused. Long story short, he wanted to take a, a Starship simulation and use it to control like his FBI-based escape room and his Christmas room and other things. What I didn't realize and this is what I kind of want to impart to you guys as developers, is the actual engine underneath Horizons had all of the things that were needed to run an escape room. An event system, a timer, all the hardware integration, you know, uh, the ability to work with web uh, content, because it's, uh, as you saw before, everything is delivered through HTML5 with WebSockets, so you could do that for a room. And if you play, many of you have played an escape room, there's that timer in the room, right, to control that. So that led me to Mythric Mystery Master. Both of them are the same core. One has a 3D engine on top of it, and you would call it Starship Horizons. The other is Mythric Mystery Master that runs escape rooms. And if you've gone to Escape to Win, you've played on Mythric Mystery Master. That runs that experience, and actually most of the escape rooms in the area uh, are running on this now. So I'm proud to say that. As a local developer, you know, I did exactly what most of us do when we're looking at something like that. I literally went escape room to escape room and said, hi, I'm local and I've done this. Great software, most of them look at you like, yeah, that, that's nice. Um, you know, thinking that I was some, you know, oh, I just kind of wrote something on a weekend and I'm, I'm happy to kind of throw it over the table to you. But then they actually went and looked at it and they said, oh, oh, okay. To be able to create immersive experiences like having a window uh, that will automatically change based on the conditions and render different images and aspects to create an immersive experience. And that's what Horizons was originally about, creating that immersive experience for your players. And now we're doing it in the real world, not just in simulation fashion. And then down in Florida, this is an escape room we work with that has a laser room where you have to do the uh, obligatory, you know, uh, crawl through the lasers and don't trip the lasers so you can escape through uh, the bag. Now, this one did something cool. They took net, uh, NES uh, zapper controllers, rewired them, to do uh, infrared signals so that you could take out the cameras in the room uh, to be able to then sneak through without being caught. Uh, all of that again running uh, on the architecture. Uh, and, uh, everybody's probably gonna give a chuckle because of the Marvel Universe, but the actual engine underneath is called the Hydra engine because of all the things it can do. Everybody comes up and says, hail Hydra. But you know. <laughs> uh, This actually is a room that is coming to escape to win uh, by the end of the year. It's called the, uh, 
the um, lunar, lunar escape. So using horizons as well, that'll actually be something you can play locally again right off of Witch Duck. Um, this is what, uh, it, what we call M3, Mythic Mystery Master, uh, looks like. Uh, again, uh, controlling through a web page, uh, typically through Chrome, but when you do this and have it delivered through a web page, of course you can use any device, right? You can use a phone and have it bootstrapped so it looks great on the phone. You can use a tablet, you can use a Raspberry Pi, anything that'll render a, a modern browser or Chromium on most of the open source devices uh, you can use. So it gives the uh, escape room facilities and anybody running Horizons, you don't need, uh, and you're gonna see tomorrow, like we have touch screens, these uh, all-in-one touch screens that we spend about $400 on each unit. You don't need to do that. You can do it with tablets, right? You can get an Android, uh, you know, the Amazon Fire 10 is I think barely $100 now, or maybe a little over 100 depending on the sale you get, right? Um, so with either one of these, imagine having 130 devices connected, uh, you know, in a Starship experience, if you think of the bridge of the Enterprise D, the next generation bridge, all those different panels all around the ship on that bridge, you know, in Hollywood, those were just fake panels that were backlit. They never actually did anything. Imagine if they all worked, right? So when it went to Red Alert, they all synchronized and went to Red Alert. When uh, you wanted to go to a com computer console and pull up uh, the encyclopedia inside the universe, all of that worked. That's kind of our goal. We're actually working with um, uh, a, a new project that I can't really talk about much about today, but uh, something in the Star Trek universe that uh, we're very much looking forward to. Let's see. Oh, and Escape to Win, which I've plugged uh, quite a bit here. Um, so that's me ranting <laughs> for a little bit and just talking about my experiences, where I came from, a lot of things I worked on. Uh, what I wanted to do and what I like to do is take the time. Is it, does anybody have questions for the things I've experienced, what I've worked on, projects that I dealt with, challenges working on Horizons or the escape room software? I, I'm not big on talking about myself for an hour. I'd rather spend the time just talking tech and talking dev. Um, I've touched on some of the technology we work on with Horizons. Uh, and um, we're actually, Horizons itself obviously gave birth to Mythic Mystery Master, but it's also, as a simulation engine, uh, moving us into the contracting space, working with um, different contracting uh, RFPs that are at the request for proposals for um, different government training related exercises. Now you would think a starship simulation doesn't make sense for say a government contract relative, say training Army or Navy or Air Force, you'd be surprised. Uh, a lot of times they focus on the training and teamwork aspects. The actual experience that they're involved in is less material. You're not necessarily training on equipment. You're not training on a particular tank or a particular submarine. You're there to get the crew to work together. And one of the coolest crews we ever had, uh, we were at an event called um, Ring of Fire Con. Anybody did Ring of Fire Con back when it was at the Holiday Inn? Um, we had a sub crew come by and want to play. And my immediate reaction was, oh, they're going to hate it because it's this silly little sci-fi game that's just, you know, it's nowhere near the complexity of what they deal with in real life. Um, but they sat down and were full military mode in the whole experience to where I was, the whole time I was terrified because they didn't show any emotion, they didn't show any, any aspect of being excited or this was cool. It was almost, I felt like they were bored and just doing a job. You know, like, oh, all right, let's just get this over with, right? But as a developer, and you see somebody enjoying your game, now, again, this is me being terrified the whole time, they hate it. They finished the, the, it's called the Homestead Company. So if it's uh, tomorrow, if you want to play one of the more in-depth missions, it's called the Homestead Company. They went and played it. They finished the mission where the fanfare comes up and they're done. And they jumped up like it was Christmas. And they were high-fiving and screaming so loud, people thought somebody was being murdered in the next room. Um, as a developer, that all that does is just make you go, oh, it was worth it. Um, and... Where I'm going with that is don't, uh, this is a topic that came up uh, at a previous Pixel Fest. Um, I, I, again, I'm gonna ask for a show of hands. How many of you have written something that you were proud of? You, you really thought it was really good, but you didn't show it to anybody else or you were worried about showing it to anybody else because you thought they'd think it was stupid? Right, okay, me too, okay? I, that's happened to me too. Don't, don't be afraid. It's your creation, it's your hard work. If they don't like it, that's okay, right? 
What's, what's the harm? The fact that they don't like it changes what? Nothing, right? If you have confidence in the love of the work you're doing, that's, that's what matters. What you will see is, you might have one person that didn't like it, and we've had people that sat down to play Horizons that were just like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. This is just, I'm, you know, okay, wow, can I leave? Um, but for every one of those people, there's 10, 15, 20 people that are just walking out of there like they've just, you know, gotten the best Christmas present in the world. And so for you as a developer, don't be afraid to share your idea or show your idea because I'm going to tell you, uh, one of the things that we've done over the years, we took Horizons to uh, the very first, uh, it was eight weeks old. So I started to, uh, development on Horizons. Eight weeks later, we went to the Norfolk Maker Fair and presented a flight station that had six buttons on it, a tactical station that had four buttons on it, and some graphics, and of course, something similar to what you saw there with the, the video, and that was it. So anybody that looked at that as a full game experience would have literally gone, ugh, right? But what we wanted to do is say, hey, here's the concept. Here's what we're thinking of. Just take that kernel and just try it. And again, people are like, oh, man, I can't wait to see what you do with this, right? Um, because people were telling me, don't show it. It's not ready. It's, you know, there's nothing there. You can hardly do anything. It's, you know, you're just going to get laughed at. Um, you know, the mistake I keep making, and I say mistake with finger quotes, is that I'm just fearless about that kind of stuff. I'm, as a developer, I'm confident in what I do. Doesn't mean it fits with what anybody else, anybody in this room, you may do something that somebody else in this room doesn't like, or, that, or it's not necessarily their cup of tea. It's not that they hate it. It's just like, hey, that's cool, but not really my thing. That's okay. Uh, I just run into so many developers that are damn good developers that are too shy or too worried somebody's gonna hate their work. Just don't, right? So I'm kind of harping on that, but it really mean, it's something that I really want you to understand is don't fear, uh, don't, don't fear opinion, right? Because for, uh, also for everyone that might be negative, you're gonna get tons of people like, hey man, that was really cool, but you know, what if, what if this, or what if that? And they're just, they're throwing ideas at you they're expanding your universe. Or they might tell you something that's legitimate. Hey, this is cool, but this doesn't really work because like, when I tried to do this, it just it feels clunky. You're getting beta testers, folks. Uh, that's when we started taking Horizons to uh, conventions with Mag Maker Faire, and we started from then on. At that point, we were doing five, six, seven conventions a year with pra nowhere near what you're going to see tomorrow or if you've already played it, what you've seen. Uh, but every one of those is an experience that you can learn from, you know, what works, what doesn't work, what's great, what sucks. It's just the nature of it. But it's not where you're sending it out over the web and getting a forum post where like, hey, you know, uh, this is the 100 things I would change with your game. You're actually seeing them play it, you're seeing them interact, and you can talk to them directly, and that's invaluable. So, you know, whether it's a game jam or if you have something you want to show in an indie showcase, do it, right? Okay. Um, all right, I've rambled on. I want to take some time for Q&A because we've got, we're still good on time. Does anybody have questions? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, have you lived in this area the whole time? Or have you supported yourself as a game developer? Oh, great question. Thank you for that. I did not clarify. Um, yes and no is the answer. <laughs> so uh, I have two companies. I have, um, and I did not cover this in the beginning, so thank you for that. Um, I have a home health care company where I do software for Medicare, Medicaid, and state contracts. That's, even today, I'll be very honest, that is my primary um, source. Mythric Studios is my secondary. However, in the last year, that is shifting dramatically and working with escape rooms and the simulation experience. But that was my plan all along, having a stable base and then shifting over time. Mythric's been around for 18 years, but for the first 10, I'm going to be honest, it was a passion project, a passion company where we were just doing stuff for fun, right? Then I started taking it seriously. Um, but I didn't just jump off and say, I'm going to quit my job wholesale and just going to go do this. Um, I took, I, by the way, I'm, I'm married. I have a 13-year-old daughter and, and four dogs, so <laughs> a lot of mouths to feed. So, no, it, it's a hybrid for me. Uh, I've lived in uh, Newport News specifically since 1994. Prior to that, I lived in Richmond. So I'm, I'm a Virginia boy uh, through and through, but uh, between Richmond and Newport News. Yeah, you weren't, yeah. 
So it looks like your engine could talk to a lot of different devices and peripherals and inputs and outputs. And, uh, um, you know, real hardware doesn't, all different protocols doesn't respond immediately. Um, is, is there anything specific that you did in your, your core engine or how it's all structured that you were, would like to talk about that makes some of that, given all that complexity possible? So are, it, just to just to clarify what you're asking, meaning dealing with things like latency and having to deal with, uh, you know, I, I can talk to uh, the challenges. That most of the devices you have to deal with out there, you're dealing with some kind of uh, either a ping or you're doing a constant, uh, you know, you're doing a constant refresh. You know, every 500 milliseconds, you're doing a check in with the, the particular hardware based on whatever protocol it is, whether it's JSON or direct serial connection. Um, that's a great technical question. So most of the classic methodologies, whether it's like a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino, you're doing some kind of a, a ping, right? And at some threshold. And with networking, depending on how many devices you have, and some of the escape rooms we've worked with have had 115, 120 different types of devices because they have 10 rooms, and every room has you know several. Arduino is a very big thing in escape rooms, by the way. That's kind of slowly shifting but uh, Arduinos are everywhere in escape rooms. So you deal with that. What we did, uh, and this is something we're actually pushing in the industry, is uh, anybody ever heard of MQTT? Okay, MQTT is, if you deal with protocols and you're dealing with hardware, I'm gonna tell you, look it up. So thank, that's a great driving question. MQTT is a brilliant protocol. It was designed for kind of the IoT era, where the whole point of how I, MQTT works it's a topic-based system. So you have a topic and a value, and the value is not strongly typed. So it could be an integer, it could be a floating value, it could be a text, it doesn't matter. Uh, it could be JSON, actually. But each topic can also have subtopics. So you can have topic slash, topic slash, topic, and that's the name. And the architecture of MQTT automatically understands that. It has built-in guaranteed delivery, built-in redelivery. Uh, and so you can also make persistence. So if a device goes offline and comes back online, it can ask the MQTT protocol, hey, what did I miss? And catch back up. And here's the other thing. It's real time with no need to ping. So what MQTT does is it's a, you either subscribe, like subscribing to a newspaper, or you publish, like publishing a newspaper article, okay? And all you do is when you connect up to any of the MQTT protocol, you say, I want to subscribe to everything you're sending. And the only time network traffic occurs is when there's a new publish. And that's it. And so in some cases with MQTT, you can have your code acting on a response from hardware within 10 to 12 milliseconds, which is absurdly fast, all things considered, when most of the time you're dealing with devices where it's 500 millisecond ping. Did that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Now, with just dealing with, you still have to deal with a lot of the devices where you're doing ping, and that's just, for us, honestly, that's just handling asynchronous um, and memory management, frankly, depending on some of the devices. Um, network is still network, and if you've got 50 devices out there and you're doing all these pings, it's about managing not the ping, but the content. So just make sure your delivery and what you're sending back and forth is not 120 characters. It's you know, minimal information and you're gonna minimize your network impact. Because I don't care how good your network is, there's always the ability to choke your network with constant network traffic. Yeah. Right, yeah, the, the, so the publish subscribe mechanism you uh, described sounds a lot like Ross, in, but you're, you said the front end was, was HTML and JavaScript. Well, f for my delivery, yes. Yeah. Um, so in M3, what is the backend framework? You mentioned y'all did a uh, in-house implementation of your uh, web server or whatever you use to host the content. Um, I would like to hear a little bit more about that. What language or framework? Oh, sure. And you know what? Shame on me. I didn't mention that before. So thank you. Yeah. Um, it's early for me, folks. I can, I can tell you. No, so it's a .NET. We're a .NET shop primarily. Um, primarily C Sharp. Um, by the way, uh, I'm old enough where I did do a uh, good, uh, good amount of assembler. Uh, I don't recommend it in the modern age, but <laughs> it, do, it does teach you to be strict on certain things, I'll tell you that. But no, it's mostly .NET. Um, uh, .NET Core is our, our original libraries for Horizons were .NET uh, 4, 4.5, then we moved on to 4.6, but now we're .NET Core Shop. Uh, so we moved everything over to that. Uh, and while today Horizons and M3 are only Windows deliverables, with .NET Core we are migrating them over to be 
uh, you know, Linux, uh, Mac OS, and Windows for that very reason. And for and I'm a Mac guy, by the way. Funny enough, even though I'm a Windows dev oh, funny thing about me, I'm a Mac, you know, uh, Apple guy who's a Windows developer, <laughs> whose favorite browser is Chrome, whose favorite TV is made by Samsung. So I'm just kind of all over the place, folks. Um, but did that answer your question? Um, talking about the pro some of the protocols. Um, we use um, a variant of uh, WebSockets from the SuperSocket protocol. Um, and uh, we, we tend to, if, uh, talking about just technology overall, we try very hard, believe it or not, to not use third-party libraries. Um, that isn't really to just say, oh, we're going to do it ourselves, screw those other guys. It's more about um, tightening the delivery. Uh, if you're delivering to an older Raspberry Pi or delivering to a device that can render HTML5 but it's not real necessarily really powerful, it's about limiting the amount of data that's coming to it and the amount of processing that browser has to do. So if you're dealing with things like Angular or uh, Bootstrap where there's a lot of computation going on for delivery, that can actually cause rendering. And Raspberry Pi in particular um, is a great platform, but it's hardware rendering. You know, it's the same graphics chip they shipped on the original Pi. So that's like one of the biggest shortcomings there. So that's the considerations we have to make for delivery is trying to make the libraries and the content as tight as possible for delivery. Yeah. You did you go to school and if you did, where did you go and what was your experience with that? Okay, uh, great question. So I, um, I went to Virginia Commonwealth University, go Rams. Uh, graduated in 1993. Uh, I did not graduate with a uh, bachelor's in computer science. I uh, uh, graduated with a bachelor of fine arts in theater performance. Uh, why, you ask? Um, this is a great side story, so thank you for asking that. Um, in high school, I was, uh, I was actually pre I was president of the computer club we called Apple Core, because back in the day it was all Apple IIs. That's all we had. Um, and so we were developing our Apple IIs. I had computer math one, computer math two, computer math. And in my senior year, we had computer math AP, which was, you know, you got college credit for it. That's what they called it back in the day. So Monday we come in, the teacher says, okay, here's your assignment. You have to create uh, this with a data architecture and you have to do a delivery and you have to be able to print it. It was basically a, a 13 point uh, project and we had to deliver it by that Friday. And that's how class started. You know, you guys know what you're doing. It's due Friday, go. I wrote it that day, turned it in at the end of class. She said, get out. Now, that makes me sound like some genius. Here's the reality, though. They told me to get out. They literally kicked me out of the class, the teacher did. Uh, so I had to go to the counselor and say, well, I can't take that. They're not allowed. What do I need to do? And she's like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, I don't know. What's, out, what's available? And they said, well, there's drama class. I said, yeah, sure, why not? So I took drama and spent the whole year doing theater. Now, rewind back to me sounding like a genius because I did it in one day. Here's what I found out months later. I ran into one of my buddies who was in that class, and he said, what did you end up doing? I said, well, I took drama. He's like, well, why did you do that? Why didn't you just stay in the class? I said, like, I couldn't, because I, I turned it in that day. He's like, yeah, you idiot. We were all done that day. You just turned it in Friday. So <laughs> everyone in the class had it done that day. They just were smart enough not to turn it in until Friday. I was not that smart. Um, but when it came time to college, for college, education-wise, I looked at, computer sciences in the colleges at the time, and they are not like what you think of today. They were primarily math-based uh, programs, where you know, trigonometry, all, you know, all these different things, and that was, the, that was what they considered to be how you learned to be a programmer, is you learned every possible kind of math in existence. And the first two years uh, at the colleges I looked at, I'm not kidding, the, you know, the, some of the classes year one were, this is a floppy disk, it stores data in binary mode. I could have taught those classes. And so I'm like, I'm not paying you to sit in a class that I could learn, or that I could teach, uh, instead of learn from. So I took, uh, went to VCU, had a wonderful time in the theater department there. Uh, it did open me up from being this you know, closet uh, shy developer to getting on stage and getting in front of people, which is why I'm kind of you know, a weird hybrid. But I actually used those four years doing theater, which to me was, it was easy to do because I was having so much fun I spent every night programming. At the time, it was either on an Amiga or an early XT model or a 286, but I literally spent every night teaching myself. Now, this is, of course, before the internet. So I had a stack of uh, programming books, the magazines where you would get the uh, actual programs in the magazine that you would have to type in by hand and learn from that. 
but I did it every night because I was such a passionate programmer. I was like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to do it myself, which comes from me writing my own web kernel and other things like that. Sometimes I'm just too stubborn as a developer on my own. And you're, some of you are going to be the same way in certain topics. That's just the nature of being a developer. Anybody else? Yeah. I'm curious about how your business has grown and how your team has grown. So you have a team? I do. That's a... I'm going to be very transparent. I do have a team, but in terms of like actual like core coding, I'm still uh, you know, at heart an indie developer, meaning it's just me. Okay? My team around me is on Horizons. I have an incredible guy. You're going to hear the music tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to sing his praises. His name's Joel Everett. He's an Emmy-winning composer that came to me and said, man, I love what you're doing. Can I help? And I'm like, yeah. Uh, and so he wrote all the music for Starship Horizons, and it's... I'm blessed to have him on that project. I also have people that have built some of my models, built some of the missions, helped me build the content. Uh, there are people that always come out to the conventions and help me run conventions. So I have a great support structure around me, but from a development standpoint, I'm still an indie developer at heart. Yeah? Um, I think probably one of the biggest problems with indie development is the money issue. Um, how, do you, how do you find the right people and, and get the money? Basically? Yeah, so... That, that is the eternal struggle, isn't it? Hey, I'm creating this great project. I don't, have a, you know, I, I don't necessarily have a business model yet, and I don't necessarily have any money, but help me work on it. Um, that's been true every step of the way, and Horizons was the first project where I actually was willing to have outside help because of the nature of, of the complexity of it. And I'm sure you've... I'm going to wait to see how many people nod. How many people have heard about the idea or something cool you're working on? They're like, yeah, man, I want to help you with that. And then you're like, oh, cool, that's great. Let's work on it together. Then you give them the list of stuff that you need help on. And they look at that and they go, oh, that's actual work. Uh, cool, man, cool. No, never mind, I'm, I'm good. And they disappear. That has happened to me two dozen times on Horizons. Because I've had people that are good coders that say, hey, man, I definitely want to help. How can I help? And I literally say, hey, here's the pinpoints I could really use some help on. Do you see anything you'd love to dig, on, dig, dig in on? And they literally just evap evaporate into the ether. Um, but that's, because look, there's no money involved, right? So th that's where it comes down to, is like, if they're investing their time, how do you deal with that? Now there's different business ways to deal with that, whether it's deferred earnings, whether it's, uh, a, if you're gonna form an actual company and not just be an indie, you're actually forming a real company, which I did, by the way, and you wanna give them a piece of that, things like that, those are all very fine-tuned discussions that have a lot of different moving parts to them, so I'm not, I'm just kind of giving you, those are some of the paths you end up walking down when you're an indie developer trying to get a team together. Uh, no different than, I mean, I'm sure Henry and Henry can talk to you about dealing with Swapfire and the, the challenges they had with that. It's the same kind of thing. Um, so there's no, you know, I'm kind of going all over the place for your answer, but there is no single answer to that, that problem. For me, I ended up accepting a lot of help that wasn't development help like I just mentioned, whether it was dealing with helping me create models or the, the uh, soundtrack, things like that, where they had an area of expertise, where they had a passion for it. And actually, that's the biggest thing. If you're going to be part of a project, you know, it's, especially if it's a project that you're working on that you don't necessarily, you're not getting paid for full time, right? You better have a passion for it, because otherwise you're going to be miserable. I mean, who wants to work on something they're not getting paid for that I mean, they feel like it's a ball and chain. And I, I, all of us have felt like that on our own projects, haven't we? Seriously, right? At some point, right? But you push through because you believe in what you're working on. So, yeah. So ultimately, I was a long-winded answer, but I don't, you know, it's, it, there's just too many moving factors there. But I, I totally have been down that exact road many, many times. Oh, yeah. Uh, what is your vision with Starship Horizon? No, no. Well, and that, that's a great question. So it actually gave birth to Mythic Mystery Master. Uh, we're we're going to be working with it in the contract space. So the, the short answer is, and we're not even done with Horizons. It's still, it's still evolving. We've still got a lot of things we're working on with it. Uh, it's a slow burn for that. Uh, but the core architecture that is Horizons has given birth to the contract space and the um, uh, escape room space. And I will tell you, the escape room space has actually been uh, very profitable for us because it's a recurring model. Horizons, uh, for those of you who don't know, you can buy it for $60, download it, and it's yours, and you have a lifetime copy. So as we keep evolving it, you know, you get all the updates and everything. Um, 
but so it is not a long-term model for success as a business, right? Because it's, it's no different than if you're a game company, you produce one game and that's all you do, you're not going to be in business very long. It's just the nature of... There. Oh. oh, there we go. I think that was a cue to tell me to get off of the mic or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, where we have evolved the architecture is into the escape room space. That is proving very successful for us uh, as a recurring model and uh, enabling me to transition from my healthcare space into the gaming space as a full-time uh, position. So I, where I am in that process, I'm about halfway. So this time next year, I will be dedicated to Mithra Studios 100% of the time, which I'm actually excited for because a lot of the work that um, you'll see tomorrow or that I've talked about, I've literally done on a laptop, on a laptop tray in bed with Netflix on till like two in the morning because I do my normal job and then I go home and I code at night. Um, but that's changing. So for us, the success is down the escape room space and the contract space. Oh, sorry. It's, we're gonna continue to evolve it. It's, it's a passion project that we'll keep. And, oh. Getting a call there. Um, so Horizons, I don't think will ever actually end development uh, because it'll. It's always been a convention experience, so I think that will remain to your your question. Um, and so it'll always be available for purchase. We've still got about another year and a half worth of development on it because it's and it's been a development for five years, folks. So that's a long time, but it's also been mainly one guy working on it at night, evolving what you see experience-wise. So we've always called it a passion project. We don't. We're not misrepresenting it as like something that uh, a larger game company would put out necessarily. Um, and there's other games in the space like um, Star Trek Bridge Crew, the VR experience. Have any of you played that? No? Okay. It's, it's a lot. It's very beautiful. It's, it's very fun. Uh, but we intentionally went down a different space with that. We will not be doing the VR for Starship Horizons because we want the experience of you sitting next to somebody. You're typing on a console and they do something. You're like, what are you doing, man? Stop! You know, where you can yell and scream at each other and, and, and because that's where the fun is, right? Like you're heading for the planet and you're telling the flight officer, turn, man, turn, and they don't turn. Again, the most common death in Starship Horizons is by planet. Anyway, did, did that better answer your question? Yeah. yeah. So one of the things I seem to have a problem with, especially when working, um, is having energy to code once you get home. Yeah. Um, what do you suggest to do for something like that, especially if you're coding all day, and then you come home and you're like, I want to work on my own thing, and you've coded all day? Uh, I, I can only speak from my experience because, I mean, literally, what, I'm, what I just described to you is exactly what I do. So, you know, I have a family, so I'll come home, we'll do dinner, we maybe do a movie or something, do, you know, I'll spend the uh, evening with my daughter. Um, I don't typically start coding in, you know, whether it's M3 or Horizons or just anything I'm working on for fun until about 10 o'clock at night. So that's, I mean, because I have that family life, right? So I'm sitting there, I'm not kidding, I have, I have one of those beds that, that you can fold up. So I, I do that, I have the little laptop tray and I throw on Netflix and for three or four hours until I am dead to the world tired, I, I code. Now for me, uh, I actually cut caffeine out of my, uh, I, I still drink soft drinks, but I cut caffeine out entirely about five years ago because I had the opposite problem is I would be ready to go to bed, and I've coded for a while, but I've had so much Mountain Dew and Dr. Pepper, I am just so wired, I'm laying there in bed trying to sleep, and I'm for three hours, and the sun comes up, and you're just like, oh. So I cut caffeine out, and from my experience personally, it's the passion that gets me going, honestly. It sounds cheesy, but it's the truth. Um, you know, I would... So for you, it might be the opposite. I, I don't know if you, uh, you know, do caffeine and things like that. And I'm, not, I'm not advocating you just do caffeine to stay awake. Um, <laughs> a lot of, trust me, a lot, I'm not a coffee guy either. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say to your question is, for me, it was the, the excitement and the passion to work on something that wasn't work-related, right? I'm not working on billing or, or payroll or, or Medicaid or Medicare codes and, and that kind of mundane stuff. Now I'm working on, you know, uh, an algorithm for the AI for how it'll fly around a planet or how it'll, you know, how I'll deal with uh, a new way for a mission design. And, and so what gets me flowing is the passion for it. And it sounds like a cheesy answer, but it is really the truth for me personally. So you mentioned earlier how a lot of people like Startup Horizons and then a lot of people don't. 
Yeah. Um, and uh, sort of one problem nowadays is that games are very accessible, so you have you know app at the app store, things like that, mm -hmm. and such. So how do you actually sort of allow Startup Horizon to be sort of sustainable when now you know on HTML5, whereas nowadays you know most of the popular games are on things like Steam and consoles. Well. And that's fair. And we're going to be on Steam, by the way. We've held off on that. They changed, like, late last year, early this year, they changed some of their licensing. Um, we're waiting until we get a few things done later this year. Uh, for We're actually changing some of our mission architecture. But uh, the truth is, we're, Horizons, uh, you know, kind of also answering the question he asked earlier, uh, Horizons is always intended to be a, uh, a group experience. So you can play, and you can play online. So you can play with friends online, but it's not really designed for that. We want you to play together. Uh, some people have actually called it uh, Dungeons and Dragons in a Starship, where uh, we have people that will get together every Friday. Some people will bring the chips, some people bring the soda, somebody orders the pizza, and they get together for six of them, get together in their home and play for Friday night. And then they come, you know, and come back and play the next Friday. We have uh, two or three groups around the country that do that exactly that. So our focus has always been the group experience. So it's not necessarily that it's competing with the, you know, the the app stores and things like that. Um, it's a and let me be very blunt. Starship Horizons as an experience is a niche market game. Let's not misrepresent it. Okay, uh, it is a very specific type of player that likes to have that simulation and that immersion. And that's what we go for is the immersion. Like uh, tomorrow when you're going to, if you come by and play it, and please everybody drop by and try it, I'm going to tell you uh, where we target is you're sitting there with a touchscreen computer that is clearly, you know, a computer. It's not some futuristic panel, right? And you've got a projection screen uh, behind that that you've got the main view screen projected on, and you're sitting in an open space like this. You're not in a starship. Right? You're not in a real starship, you're not weightless, you're not floating around in space or traveling to the real Mars. But I'm going to tell you, where we focus our efforts on is everything around you disappears. Because you're in the experience, you're in the moment. And you're like, wait, wait I haven't scanned him yet, hold on, wait, 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 okay, hold on. All right, you go around there and you're, you're talking to each other and you're yelling back and forth, or you know, either in anger or in excitement. Um, and so our focus is that experience and we know that it is not for everyone, and it's not trying to be everything to everyone, and it never will be. But that's we know that as a mission statement relative to what Horizons is. Okay. All right. I think we're, uh, are we at time? I think we're at time. Okay. Maybe, it's okay, yeah, go ahead. Um, it sounds like you take us to a lot of conventions every year, and also there's like a lot of screens, a lot of like equipment and stuff. Do you, I mean, this is just a very practical question. Like, have you learned anything having to pack this thing up and take it everywhere now and make it? Fit? Oh, yeah. <laughs> or anything you could share about that? Do you guys have so much stuff? Yeah. So, um, that's a great question just from a practical standpoint. So, um, what you're going to see tomorrow will fit, uh, I can fit two of what you're going to see tomorrow in the back of my Ford Explorer. Okay, um, I use uh, travel cases, uh, the uh, rugged travel cases that have rollers on them, so I can roll it. Um, all of the mo touchscreen monitors and its power supplies and everything will fit fit in one case. And then we took uh, a server, a little mini. It's actually it's a Mac Mini running Windows, um, but that and we have a um, Ethernet rack and wireless and everything built into a small travel case that we just pop the front and back off on, plug everything in. And so it's really two cases that an entire bridge fits in, not including the projection screen. So that's you know one like flip over the shoulder um, case. So it's uh, two hard cases, the projection screen case, and uh, a projector, which you'll flip over the shoulder as well. We can fit an entire bridge into those four items. So I can easily fit two of that in my Ford Explorer. Uh, at MAGFest, plenty of you done MAGFest before? Some of you? If you haven't, Music and Gaming Festival up at the Gaylord in Maryland, oh, so much fun. Um, we run six bridges from Thursday to Sunday, so we have to get six of them up there. So it's more than just me dealing with that. <laughs> Anyone else? Any final questions? Okay. Oh, no, go ahead, please. Oh, 
Yeah, and I, great clarification. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's an HTML5 delivery, so it's keyboard and we have people do keyboard and mouse. Touchscreen is the most common just because it has that futuristic feel, but it's absolutely not required. Great question. Uh, when it's released to Steam, is it only going to be local multiplayer or will you be able to play online? No, no, you'll be able to play as a bridge together online, but also multi-bridge. So you can actually play Starship to Starship where somebody else is, you know, in another state or at another house. So, and again, to your original question, we encourage that the group we encourage the group be together because I'm going to tell you it's just more fun. I've played Star Trek Bridge Crew, the VR one that was done, um, where you play essentially online with other people, and that's neat, but nothing replaces being able to sit there with your buddies and play. It's just, I, it's so much more fun. But when it's bridge to bridge, those bridges can be cooperative, like you're going on a mission together, or it could be head to head. And the mission itself will designate what, what type of... Uh, uh, combat you're dealing with. Are you with together or are you opposed? So, yeah. Really quick, uh, really quick um, so you said they need six people, right, to play? Uh, that, yeah, six is the uh, current max. We're actually going to be allowing seven with a medical station. You can play with three. Okay, I was going to say. Hey, yeah, I, I, I kind of, I've had that question before, yeah. So you, as long as you have a flight officer and tactical officer, the third person actually can play the other stations as necessary. Um, and just to give you an example, flight and tactical are by far the most, uh, the stations that have the most content in terms of experience for constantly doing something, meaning constantly on the controls. Flight officer obviously is constantly steering the ship. But uh, science officer can be hit or miss sometimes, communications officer is the same. And the, we always refer to the engineer as uh, a casual play experience with moments of sheer terror. Because suddenly when everything breaks on the ship and you're like, Ugh! you know, um, you know, why do you think Scotty was on the bridge all the time? Because everything was working. So he was just hanging out up there. Um, so I, I'll answer one final thing because I know we're at time. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, talking about that experiences for those six players, obviously each experience is different. And the challenge for us as a developer is how to make sure each one has a, even though it's unique experiences, how can we make sure each one is fun? So two things about that, then I'll wrap up. One is obviously just the design of the interface and the experience and making sure there's content for that particular player with whatever the mission design is, right? So if it's a diplomatic mission, there may not be a lot of combat, but maybe the tactical officer is having to do analysis on are there any threats in the area? So you're giving them something to do. But also, this is a simple thing, just level setting the expectation with the player. You know, with engineering, again, if everything's working, what are you doing, right? What was Jordi LaForge doing? Just walking around engineering going, okay, everything's great. But if you set the expectation with the player in advance, they know what to expect and they have a good time as a result. And so for Horizons, because there's so many people that are playing, there are going to be players that want to enjoy it, but they don't necessarily want to be doing something every second. And that's where you say, hey, why don't you play engineering? You'll have a blast. And then they can watch everybody else panic and have a good time. And when it's their turn to panic, they enjoy that. Um, really weird question. Have you thought about like just releasing the the, the consoles for like being tactical or whatever on like an iPad? You can already do that today because it's HTML5. So you just pull up the browser on your iPad. Yeah, and you can do it on your. Actually, we have a captain's console that's built for the phone. So like uh, you could have it right here, and it just has like abandoned ship <laughs> um, and things like that. Um, and from a game design perspective, you try to make sure everybody has unique things they can do so, so one player can't just run the whole game. And I know we're over time, right? So we gotta, we gotta wrap up. Thank you, everybody.